So we are back to Rumi. Uh, I believe I mentioned last time that um, Rumi's scribe, the person who fought, was always at his side transcribing all this incredible poetry that would just roll out of Rumi's mouth faster than he could write it down himself. And at one point, his scribe suggested that he should write this big book that would be like the definitive book. And, and he wound up doing that over a period of some years. The book is called the, the Masnavi, the Masnavi. And um, a lot of the poems of Rumi that, that we read these days and that, that you'll see here and there are actually from the, the Masnavi. It's, it's his masterpiece. But what's very interesting, it took him 12 years to write it. It fulfills six volumes. It's huge. And very interesting that at the very beginning is this inscription. He wrote, and remember, he came from a, a, a Muslim background. This is the book of the Masnavi, and it is the roots of the roots of the roots of the Islamic religion. And it is the explainer of the Quran. Okay, one more time. This is the book of the Masnavi, and it is the roots of the roots of the roots of the is Islamic religion. And it is the explainer of the Quran. Okay, that's a bold statement. <laughs> right? um, but what I love about this is, you know, people are often so eager to say, oh, well, this is a, a Sufi poet, and this is a, a Catholic poet. Actually, next week, I think we're going to go on to Gerard Manley Hopkins, who was a Catholic priest. Um, this is a whatever. The, this person comes from the Zen tradition or from the, 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 the Judi Jewish tradition. And, you know, that's just putting the stuff in boxes. And the people who really delve into the stuff at the level where, you know, it becomes really interesting, really compelling. Um, it, it, you know, they're going to the roots of the roots of the roots. And um, turns out that when you go to the roots of the, when you get to the roots of the roots of the roots of the Islamic religion, it's pretty, you know, it all kind of converges there. That's the roots of the roots of the roots of Buddhism and, and everything else. Um, so I like that. And also, and it is the explainer of the Quran. That's such a bold statement. That doesn't the Quran explain itself? Doesn't the, 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 doesn't the New Testament or the Old Testament explain itself? But of course, what we keep seeing in Rumi's poetry over and over, and in all the poetry we'll be looking at here, is that it's the testament to the experience, the experience, the direct encounter with this beingness, which is the, the root of the root of the root of our life, and that that's the, the explainer. Then all the stuff, all the stories in the various scriptures, all the dogma, all the stuff that seemed, can seem so mystifying and seem so different from one to the other, it all makes sense. This is the explainer. Okay, so are you, you kind of hearing that? Is that, that resonating for you? So let's, um, let's go to a, another roomy poem. And um, I'll read, we'll discuss, a good time will be had by all. Uh, if you have the book, The Enlightened Heart, an anthology of sacred poetry, edited by, edited by Stephen Mitchell, highly recommended. So if you've got the book, this one is on page... 59. Out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, the world is too full to talk about. 
ideas, language, even the phrase each other doesn't make any sense. I'll read it again. Out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, the world is too full to talk about. Ideas, language, even the phrase each other doesn't make any sense. Okay. Is this talking to you? Yeah, it's really great, isn't it? It's, it's, it's so wonderful. Um, anyone have anything in particular you want to say about this one? I do. Yes, please. Sometimes, I, and I've read this one before, and sometimes when I read these things, there is just a sense of it. Mm -hmm. You know, that I wouldn't be able to describe it or explain it or intellectualize it. But there's just this sense. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. It's so good. It's so good. Yeah. So good. And, and in a sense, you're saying, of course, exactly what Rumi is saying here. We can't, you know, all that intellectualizing and all the, our attempts to conceptualize, that's language, that's logic, that's... You know, and what we're talking about is what you're calling that sense. And that, you know, and when we get really, you know, even from a distance, we can get that sense. And what's so incredible about Rumi and some of these other poets is that when he says these simple words, even, even, what is this, 800 years later, even translated from Persian into English, even having to make the, the transition of the, you know, the cultural difference and the historical differences between then and now, we, we can, you can feel that power in the words, you know, right? You get the sense, he's not just saying words about this. He's just, you know, he's talking from there. He is lying down in that field. You just, you, 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 you know it, and, and we can't explain why. Um, and we can't, and, and, and you can't fake that. You know what I mean, Joni? I do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He would have been a great um, ad man because just that poem really makes you want to meet him in that field. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Todd, um, at a certain point early in my life, I used to think, gee, would I, maybe I'd like to go into the advertising field because I was just fascinated with it as, um, as an art form. Like, how can you convey just a whole, as Jody said, a whole sense of something, the whole experience of, of being, of what it feels like to drive a, you know, a Mercedes Benz or whatever it is in, in, in how can you, how can you convey the most sense of something, the most experience in the fewest words, the most impact to the most people and, and in the, in the, the just in the cleanest and the, the, the kind of the quest for that, that cleanness of expression that, you know, the best advertisements, uh, achieve. That's what poets are always trying to achieve. But but this thing, out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing. I mean, how many arguments, how many arguments have you had this week on Facebook with friends about what's wrong and what's right? You know, and and you know, who should Biden pick for his running mate and which statues should be pulled down and which statues shouldn't be pulled down and all. The, and on a certain level, we have to do all that. That all belongs to our, you know, life in the human arena. We don't want to use this stuff as an excuse to stop being citizens and stuff. We, we, we have to participate in that to some degree. But if that's all you have, 
If all you have is, is that arena, that's right, that's wrong. I'm right, you're wrong. I, 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 you're right, I'm wrong, <laughs> right? It, it's just, it's, it's exhausting and it's limiting. You know, to have a full life, you've got to, there's got to be that other place beyond right and wrong, beyond yes and no, beyond male and female, beyond hot and cold, beyond day and night, beyond childhood and old age, beyond all the, all the dualities. Being this or being that, beyond that, there's this field where it's just being. Yeah. You know, and those of you who've been doing meditation for a while, you, you know that experientially. Other people hear that, maybe they get a sense of it. If, they, if I say something like that, maybe they go, what the hell is he talking about? Even the phrase each other doesn't make any sense. I mean, you know, that's like our most fundamental concept. You know, even if we don't have any concepts of politics or religion or history or anything, pretty basic. There's Aunt me and there's you. Right? But there was a time when we didn't have that. There was when we were infants, you know, and there was just kind of this blur of experience. And then out of that blur, out of that soup, one other person started to kind of coalesce. Mama, mama. You know that, where that word comes from, mama. mama. That comes from nursing. That's, you know, the sound. If you've seen, watch, you know, little newborn kids, they, they all do that when they're trying to nurse. So that, and, and in almost every language, the word for mother has that M sound in it. And so that's like our first sound. And then the first person that coalesces out of the soup. And then, you know, after, once you got a second person, that might even, there might even be a sense of mama as a person before there's a sense of, oh, there's also me, baby, who's experiencing all this stuff. And then we're off to the races and, you know, we get all the seven billion others sooner or later. But if we can go back to that place where there's no each other, but without the fogginess of the, of the baby, with all the alertness, all the wide awakeness that we've developed in the intervening years to fully experience just that field beyond individuation. Wow. You know, it's a lot of work being a person. You know, I got, every morning I got to get up and freaking be Dean. I got to brush Dean's teeth. <laughs> you know, I got to, right? Not too bad now because I'm retired from the day job. But, but you know, just just being an individual, you know, there's that great... Uh, I think we talked about this on the Thursday meditation, those of you who are there, the, the great quote from uh, Ram Dass's teacher, Emmanuel, um, when Ram Dass asked Emmanuel, uh, you know, I'm work I do a lot of hospice work. What can I tell dying people about death? And Emmanuel said, tell them two things. One, it's absolutely safe. Two, it's like taking off a tight shoe. Right? So this individual, individual, individuality, this sense of being a person, an ego, a personality, schlepping all this history behind, this personal history behind us, schlepping toward our goals. We got to do it. It's fine on one level. On another level, it's so exhausting, but, and it's so refreshing to just ah, throw that off where there's no persons, no each other. And, and that's what he's talking about here. You know, you got to have that time out place. You got to go to the free parking square, at least for a while. And then you can come back and go around to, you know, Marvin Gardens and Ventnor Avenue and all that. Okay. Can I just say, um, also just, you know, when you were saying like what Jody said about how it's just like, there are no words for what's being said. And I was thinking about how it's so precise the way that he does write like you were saying poets and advertising <laughs> copy mm -hmm. that you could just see him in the simplicity of that being so 
careful with every single word and just how to say it so that it doesn't take you off in some dualistic reality, you know? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. And you know, the, the, the story is that he, all of this came, came tumbling out of him spontaneously and his scribe wrote it down, but then he did go through and edit. Right. So he did go back and refine the language, hone the language. Um, you know, there's always this dream that my art, my painting, my music, you know, like like when the when the the, the bebop musicians, when 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 Dizzy Gillespie and Charlie Parker and those guys in the 40s and the 50s started playing this w w wild music and and people, you know, the beats like Allen Ginsberg and Jack Kerouac started going to the to the clubs up on you know 52nd Street, and they said, "Oh, these great you know wild men musicians. This music is just pouring out of them spontaneously, and that's the way I'm going to write my poetry and all that." But it turns out that Ch Ch Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie, those guys were really disciplined musicians. They played the scale 16 hours a day. They, they explored all the possibilities in a particular melody of a standard or something, how you could, you know, deconstruct it. And, go, and, and then on that basis, they were able to, to play. So, you know, there always is, there's this, there's in art, there's, there's spontaneous flow and there's also craft, you know, to some degree at every level, I think. Let's read another. Yes. Can I just say something about that? I was just feeling you. Mm -hmm. there's this sweetness to the way he writes that's not just, hey, it's me and I'm having this particular experience. Mm -hmm. He's always an, it's always an invitation. You know, yeah. it's like out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing. It's like he's saying, I see you. I see you there. Yeah. Fighting to 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 prove that you are here yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know with everyone around you yes who, yes who like oh dar dar darling you're working so hard <laughs> at being at being a special person and you know as we all are but to be a special person first you have to be a person and that's so much work and you don't have to do it but it's so but you're right thank you for pointing that out because there is and this is another thing you can't fake that that just spontaneous that warmth that generosity that welcoming quality to to Rumi not I am up on the mountaintop being you know I am out in the field but oh I'll meet you there it's no problem and it's easy to be there you know it's like Jesus when Jesus you know didn't say I'm special Jesus said uh, yeah my 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 yoke is light my burden is easy you you can all do this what struck me Mm -hmm. was that um, they lay down yeah. so one isn't higher than the other. Yeah. And, and Mother Earth is supporting them. Yeah. The They're just one. Yeah. yeah, 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 that lying down. You know, one of, one of the best things that ever happened to me as a meditation teacher was, was when one of my teachers, you know, so many teachers emphasize, oh, sitting properly and all that. And one of my teachers said, you know, if you feel like lying down, just lie down. Like, Whoa, is that okay? Yeah, why not? <laughs> why not? But yeah, you're right. It's so, it's so kind of beautifully democratic and the embrace of Mother Earth. You know, and it's not we're in, we, it's not you know we're lying on a on the parking lot. We're we're lying in the field. It's alive, you know. Yeah. We're we're in that grass. Yeah. And of course, we could also write a parking a, a parking lot poem, embracing <laughs> the you know finding God in the parking lot as well. Oh, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Good, good. Okay, let's do another one. Um, Dean, I think Kelly yes. wanted to say something. Ah, okay. Thank you. You're not, you're muted, Kelly. Thank you. Well, seems like uh, he's uh, pointing to our peaceful nature, you know, you know, innate, our putting out our peaceful innate nature. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's our peaceful, innate nature. It's absolutely, it's not that this is something we have to develop. It's not something we have to construct or can construct. You know, one of my teachers, one Lama I used to study with, he used to say, get out of the construction business, right? What, what, is, what is there a priori? What is there prior to anything we can construct with our mind or our ego? Before we start building all these grand edifices, there, well, actually, there's the field. There's the field. And rather than try to stand up and be this and be that, as, as Judy says, we just lie down in the field. It's the field of our own nature. Absolutely. Thank right. you, Kelly. Good. Okay, let's do, let's look at another one. Um, a little longer one. It's on page 63. Uh, you know, again, uh, the way I like to read these when, when someone else is, 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 when they're being read is to, um, um, first just listen, uh, but what, but whatever, what, whatever works for you. So, so you may want to just listen to it the first time. Um, and then, you know, follow along the second time. I always like to read stuff twice. But if you're following along, it's on page 63. Praise to the emptiness that blanks out existence. This place made from our love for that emptiness. Yet somehow comes emptiness. Uh, sorry, I misread that. Yet somehow comes emptiness this existence goes. Praise to that happening over and over. For years, I pulled my own existence out of emptiness. Then one swoop, one swing of the arm, that work is over. Free of who I was, free of presence, free of dangerous fear, hope, free of mountainous wanting, the here and now mountain is a tiny piece of a piece of straw blown off into emptiness. These words I'm saying so much begin to lose meaning. Existence, emptiness, mountain, straw. Words and what they try to say swept out the window down the slant of the roof. Oof. <laughs> this, this, this thing is huge. One more time. Praise to the emptiness that blanks out existence. Existence. This place made from our love for that emptiness. Yet somehow comes emptiness. This existence goes. Praise to that happening over and over. For years, I pulled my own existence out of emptiness. Then one swoop, one swing of the arm, that work is over. Free of who I was, free of presence, free of dangerous fear, hope, free of mountainous wanting. The here and now mountain is a tiny piece of a piece of straw blown off into emptiness. These words I'm saying so much begin to lose meaning. Existence, emptiness, mountain, straw. Words and what they try to say swept out the window, down the slant of the roof. Oh man, this is good. <laughs> uh, where to start? Where to start? You know, this is, especially those of you who have a, a Buddhist background, uh, um, y y I think in that first stanza, you're going to hear the echo of the, um, the Heart Sutra, mm -hmm. right? The Heart Sutra uh, form, and this is really kind of the kernel statement, the E equals MC squared of, of Mahayana Buddhism. Form is no other than emptiness. Emptiness is no other than form. And it's such an impossible statement that the mind immediately starts looking for loopholes. So in the next line, it restates it a little differently. 
Form is exactly emptiness. Emptiness is exactly form. Right? Now here, Rumi, or we don't know what words, or I don't know what words he used in Persian, but the, his, his translator here, Coleman Barks and John Moyne, uh, have used the words emptiness and existence. Existence. So it, it seems clear to me here that existence is being used pretty much in the way that the word form is used uh, in the in the Heart Sutra. So those of you who are familiar with that, you know, form is form is is this stuff. It's chunky, chunky existence. You know, our the our usual familiar existence. Here, there's a shirt and there's a pair of glasses and there's a a, a a Homo sapiens and there's a microphone and so forth. Form all this form. And the hue and and then there's what we experience. Um, can experience at any moment. Most commonly, we experience it in the most settled moments of meditation. Emptiness. Oh, complete silence. Complete. There's no form. There's no chunkiness. There's no blue this or black that. There's no qualities. There's no high pitch sound. There's no low pitch sound. There's. It's just nothing. It's just nothing. But as my old teacher Mari, she said, it's just nothing, but there's something very good about it. It's the ah, the luminous emptiness, right? So we experience both of those things. And then the, the great statement is they are exactly the same. They look different. They look different. But it's like, it's like you know, Einstein, E equals MC squared. Energy is matter. Matter is energy. They're just expressing in different ways, right? They seem complete. That seems impossible. Most of us can't follow the physics, so we, but 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 we know that Einstein's supposed to be right. We kind of t take this impossible statement on faith, right? In a way, this is an even more basic statement, you know, that that form, all the uh, matter, energy, all of it, the world of form is nothing but that nothingness, right? So, but here, Rumi is describing this, I think, in experiential, as usual, in, in, in experiential terms, right? Praise to the emptiness that blanks out existence, right? I mean, th right? This is what happens in meditation. This is, this is why we bother to schlep ourselves onto the couch or the meditation cushion day after day after day, because as Maharishi said, it's just nothing, but there's something very good about it. There's just something so refreshing, so great, so fulfilling about being in that place of emptiness and where all the, the busyness of the chunky world is just leaves us for a while. Existence, and then there's a colon at the end of the line. So now we, we're going to be talking about existence. Existence. This place made from our love for that emptiness. Wow, there is a potent statement. Remember being a little kid and asking, you know, mom, dad, where did everything come from? Why, why is there a universe? How did this happen? How did all this something come out of nothing? Right? Right? And depending on who your parents were, they might have said, well, it all came from the Big Bang. First out of nothing, there's a Big Bang, and then from there you get hydrogen. And then after that, it's easy. Once you got hydrogen, we, we, we know then how you can get helium and then, you know, all the other elements. And they combine, recombine, they make galaxies, you know, microphones, shirts, all that. that that's easy. If you had different parents, maybe they said, well, for, there's God. And then God makes everything. Or maybe your Sunday school teacher. Now, if you were a clever child, then you ask the Sunday school teacher, yeah, but how does God come out of nothing? You know, and then that's the point where the teacher says, time for cookies and milk. <laughs> because it's an imponderable question. There's no, it's an unanswerable question. You know, or, yeah, but where does the Big Bang come from? 
right? How do we get for whatever, and, and no matter how far back the, the theologians push it or the physicists push it, there's, there's a place. They say, oh, well, before the Big Bang, there's, I don't know if there's quarks come from before that or whatever. No, whatever it is, there's some point where we're going from nothing to something. And that's impossible. That's impossible. We can't go, there's an, it's an unbridgeable gap. Okay? And so what, what the Heart Sutra tells us in, in, in the Buddhist world, and Rumi is telling us here, is, uh, yeah, there is no way to go from the something to the nothing. What it is, is they're the same thing. The, all the something is nothing in drag. Okay, all, all the something is the nothing play, playing the role of something. Or as Rumi puts it so beautifully, existence, this place made from our love for that emptiness. Where does the universe come from? Where does that first inkling of creation come from? You know, the let there be light, the in the beginning was the word. It's love. It's love. And if we just think of love as a human emotion, the way most people think of it, that makes no sense. It's way too limited. No, love has got to be, you got to get the whole universe and then evolve through, you know, seaweed and, and, and you know, whatever, antelopes and, and anteaters and so forth. And then you get to humans and then humans evolve emotions. And then at the end of the process, we get to love. But what we're being told here is, no, that's backwards. Love is the very beginning of the process. And, you know, the best way to make sense of this experientially, uh, some of you have been to this thing that I recommended. I'm going to put it in, in my next newsletter, which I'll, you'll get on Tuesday morning. Uh, it's a link to a meditation on George Floyd and Derek Chauvin, um, led by Rupert Spira, who is an incredible teacher, one of my very, very favorite, most beloved teachers. And this will all make much, much more sense to you after you've, you've gone through that, because love is not an emotion. Love is, is non-separateness. Love is non-separateness. Love is not just this little wave over here, seeing that little wave over there and going, wow, that wave over there, there's something about it that attracts me. It's, it's form or it's style or it's whatever. And I have some special feeling for that wave over there. That's a certain level of human level of love, but it's pretty superficial. That the real love worthy of the name is wave over here, wave over here, realize we're both the same ocean. Everything's the same ocean. There's only that ocean. There, there is no separateness. So, in a sense, we could say, to, to put these two models together, the ocean is the ocean of emptiness. The ocean of... The ocean of, in, in, in Hindu philosophical terms, for those of you familiar with that, that's the ocean of Brahman. And that's even used, you know, some of you are familiar with in the, you know, the, in the Hindu scheme of things or in the, you know, the Hindu stories, it starts off with this wave, this ocean of, of beingness, this ocean of Brahman. And, and, you know, Vishnu is lying on the ocean on a special bed and he dreams the universe out of that. Um, all these kind of metaphors for this idea that out of that formless nothingness, the emptiness, because it can, because it's more fun, because it's, uh, right, because love, it, 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 it makes or appears to me or arises as existence. Existence, this place made from our love for that emptiness. Yet somehow comes emptiness, this existence goes. 
right? So you see, we have the process back and forth out of the emptiness existence manifests, but then the emptiness comes again and the existence goes, right? So we have manifestation and meditation. We get the creation of the universe. We get the dissolution of the universe, right? We have Lord Vishnu uh, dreaming the universe in Hindu terms. And then we have Lord Shiva, my guy over here on the altar, dissolving the universe. And that's why Lord Shiva is the, he's the associated with meditation. Because every time we meditate, we're essentially in those terms, in those Hindu terms, we're, we're Shiva, we're dissolving the universe. Praise to that happening over and over. There's just this beautiful rightness of it. Uh, and, and you have to have both of those strokes. The, you, you create the universe. We create the universe because we are that beingness. We are that ocean. We create it. We destroy it. We create it. We destroy it. You got to have both. Otherwise, your life is out of balance. You have a bunch of people whose life is out of balance. The world gets crazy. It's, you see, when you look out, out the window here, look at the news. And then he, be, he makes the story personal. He gives his testimony. For years, I pulled my own existence out of emptiness. Right? This is like what we get, do when we get up every morning. Actually, because in sleep, you dissolve into that emptiness. Only it's not conscious. So the difference between meditation and sleep is, is you conk out. When you go in, in sleep, you conk out when you go into that, that emptiness. In meditation, you remain awake to experience it. But still, every morning we've got you know, we to open our eyes and become Dean again. For years, I pulled my own existence out of emptiness. Then, one swoop, one swing of the arm, that work is over. So I have to think that here Rumi is alluding to his awakening, right? His his you know, that, that there was that moment, there was that day when he, he permanently, he irreversibly saw through the, the charade of individuality. And once that happens, you, as my old teacher Maharishi once said, it's like you're going along, you're pushing the little red wagon, you're pushing the little red wagon, you're pushing the little red wagon. One day you give it one last push and it just kind of goes, goes on by itself. Right? So that's when the sense of doership goes away. The sense that there is this I, this individual I that has to do all this stuff. You know, enlightenment is the lazy person's paradise because you literally don't do anything. It's still being done, but the sense that there's me, uh, I got to do all that stuff, that's gone. That's gone. Because you're no longer identified with the body that has to, you know, move the toothbrush or the, or the mind that has to think the thoughts and do the income taxes or with the, the personality that has to interact with all the personalities. All that's going on, but none of it's you. It's all witnessed. It's all just kind of witnessed. You know, Jesus says this at the end of um, the Gospel of Thomas. Be passers-by. That's so beautiful, so concise. Be passers-by. It's just happening and you're just, you're seeing it. You're an uninvolved witness. Now, this is often misunderstood. People, oh, I'm going to try to be uninvolved. I'm going to, they say, oh, it's detachment. I got to try to be detached, which winds up usually meaning suppressing your emotions. Total misunderstanding. When as the real thing dawns, no, have all the, all the emotions you want because it's not you having them. I mean, all the most awake teachers I've been around, they're not going around like be trying hard to be solemn, like, you know, acquiring their enlightenment like a, like a fragile jug balanced on top of their head and you know it's just they know they laugh they cry they're they're not like some it's not precious it's just it's so natural there because there's no way for it to spill the real thing then one swoop one swing of the arm that work is over right one swoop someone something some grace we could say swoops away that 
sense of ownership, that sense of, of separate selfhood. And then he describes it, what, what we're like after that swoop, free of who I was, right? Free of individuality, free of presence, free of dangerous fear, hope, free of mountainous wanting, right? You're free of all that. It doesn't mean it's not there. And again, this is how it's misunderstood. People think, oh, I have to suppress my desires. That's spirituality. I have to suppress my, my uh, what is it, my fear, uh, my hope. No, 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 no. That, that's, uh, that's, not, that's way too superficial and it's way too artificial. You just, you just, fun you know, <laughs> Woody Allen had a joke. Uh, 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 I'm not afraid of death. I just don't want to be there when it happens. Right. So that that's how all this stuff is. It it's all there, but you it's still there, but you're not there. The the you that you thought you were, the individual you that you, you thought had to do all that stuff is is gone. Is also gone. also can I just say it's also that you don't have to get everything clear and quiet and all your ducks lined up yeah. in order to have this clarity. Like you know, I mean it's not just that you can still have your hopes and fears, but it's also, I think a lot of people have this precious idea that the only way they can become enlightened is if they got everything else calm and everything else clear and everything else figured out. Right, so. right, right, right. Thank you. Yeah. As if the clarity, the awakening, the, the emptiness, the God is on the other side of some moment someday when I get, as you say, all my ducks in a row, when I get everything tidy, when I emotionally get everything resolved, when my, my lifestyle get everything resolved. You know, Yafa, that's completely connected with the thing I said in the meditation at the beginning, which was, you know, it's, it's, it's like when, when mom says, clean up the room, Right? And, and people think, oh, meditation is like cleaning up all the mess of your mind, cleaning up the room of your mind. No, we're just going to lie down and take a, take a nice rest. We're going to flop down in the middle of the mess. Just leave it as it is. You know, I deliberately did that in the meditation. And then we just carry. Now, it doesn't mean, oh, just become lazy. And, you know, yeah, well, there's certain business we have to take care of. But we're not going to attain grace. We're not going to attain awakening by virtue of taking care of business. We're not going to get, get there by being good. No one can be good enough to earn grace. And no one can be bad enough to lose grace. It's got nothing to do with us, with the small us. You know, that's to, to try to think of it as being within the power of the small self to gain it or to lose it is in a sense sacrilege. It's making it something small. You know, in a way, this is this takes us back to, um, you know, the film or the play Amadeus, which is you know all about the how the, the you know the Mozart character Mozart whether he was really like that historically at least in the play and in the movie he's this completely irresponsible child, this, you know, wacky, you know, sensualist and all that. And he gets the grace of the, the beautiful divine music coming through him. And Salieri, who is so good and so virtuous and works so hard, doesn't get it. Well, sometimes that's the way it is. <laughs> grace is, that is grace. That's why it's called grace. And, and none of us can work hard enough in meditation to get it. The only way we can do is by just, you know, the day of the Lord comes like a thief in the night. No one knows the hour or the day of his coming. All we can do is, is leave the door, our doors and windows wide open and sit quietly. The more we work, the busier we are at trying to meditate or trying to be good, trying to make the thief come, the more we scare the thief away. Which, by the way, is going to bring us, if we have time, to our next poem. Oh, we're running out of time. Um, the here and now mountain is a tiny piece of a piece of straw blown off into emptiness. 
these words I'm saying so much begin to lose meaning, existence, emptiness, mountain, straw. Even these words that, as we've seen, these are, these are about the best words we've ever heard for invoking you know, this, real, this wonderful reality. And then here's Rumi giving us the disclaimer. Yeah, even these words are kind of too much. Just they blow out the window down the slant of the roof. Wow. Wow. Um, okay, what to do here? Uh, should we do one more Sunday on Rumi or, 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 or should we move on? Uh, give me a sense. One more day, one more Sunday of Rumi? Okay, good, good. One more. All right, good, good. So I'll see you next Sunday and um, uh, see some of you on Tuesday and Thursday for meditation. So may all beings swiftly realize the true happiness, realize, notice that they've been that ocean of emptiness all along and thus may peace prevail everywhere. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Dean. Have a nice day. Great. Thank you. Thanks very much. See ya. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye, Alpha. <laughs> Bye.